Okay, so a little bit of review. Last week, we looked at what happened at Pentecost. It was not the, necessarily the infilling of the Spirit, which happened in the upper room to those disciples when he breathed on them. So he promised them what he said was power, empowering of the Spirit, so that you can be witnesses. He empowered them to be his witnesses. And here's what happened at the end of the day of Pentecost, after everybody's asking what's going on here, because they heard everyone speaking in their language, and then Peter gives a sermon. Then after that sermon, and after 3,000 responded and were baptized, we have this testimony of Scripture. Every soul was struck with awe at the wondrous works of God. Signs and wonders were being done by the apostles. There was a huge outpouring of generous giving so that everyone's needs were met. There was a supernatural unity in the body. They were bonded together in one place. It says one heart and one mind. Boy, oh, for that to happen again among the churches. You know, the Reformation, I would have thought, would have brought that together, bringing us back to the Word. But since the Reformation, we continue to get divided over the Word. So one of the things I look forward to in the supernatural empowering of the Spirit is bringing us back together in unity. They had daily fervent worship in the temple and in homes. They had favor with all the people. Reminds me of that phrase that Luke says of Jesus. He had favor with God and man as he was growing up. And then people were being saved daily. And we boiled it down to the behavior of the church, that is. We boiled it down in Acts 2.42 to four things. The apostles' teaching, which I called true teaching because it was true to Scripture, the God's truth, and it was done by true teachers, those who were appointed and gifted to do it. Fellowship, I'm calling it flourishing fellowship because it's supposed to be a thriving thing, both in terms of, of uh, what happens when the Spirit fills us with the Spirit, there's a flourishing fellowship, and, and, and in terms of keeping and staying filled with the Spirit, our, apply, our applying ourselves to a flourishing fellowship is what's gonna cause us to thrive. Then there was the breaking of bread, and we're going to tackle that next week with kind of a whole new angle, I think. At least it was for me as, I, as I've been wrestling with the church's place in the community and how we reach our community and our world. Uh, I think this uncovers all sorts of wonderful, sometimes mysterious uh, blessing here in the breaking of bread, referring to two really cool things that we'll talk about next week. But because of that, I call it hospitable homes. And then prayers. Passionate prayer, I've called it, because the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But today's sermon is on fellowship. The definition, the meaning of it, the word, the Greek word, it's koinonia, very familiar to most of you if you've been in the church for very long. And it basically means what is held in common, what is shared together. It is a feminine noun, which I think is so appropriate because it's the key element in the body of the bride of Christ. And the lexical definitions are things like association, community, joint participation, whatever we share in common and what is shared in common, like Koine Greek. It uses part of that word. The Koine means common. It was the common language of the culture at that time. Contact, especially personal contact, eye-to-eye -eye contact, face-to-face, -face, intimacy. It also can mean what is shared, jointly contributed, like a collection or a contribution. Uh, here are some various translations in the New Testament, different words. Fellowship is probably the most common translation of it. In Philippians 1, he talks about we share a common faith. Our fellowship is generated by the fact that we have a common faith. Contribution or distribution is another word that is translated. In 2 Corinthians 8 and in 9, Paul uses this word to talk about sharing financially, sharing what you have financially so that one church can help another. Partnership is used in a number of translations on a number of occasions. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, where Paul is calling for purity, he says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship or partnership does light have with darkness? Or in Galatians 2, 9, when Paul, uh, three of the disciples, uh, Paul said, handed him the right hand of Christian fellowship. They were welcoming him in, in to their group as a partner in the ministry. And then in Philippians 1, 5, we have, Paul says, you are my partners in the gospel. There's the word participation. There's the word sharing. In fact, that's what Paul uses in Philippians 3, 10 when he says, 
we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. That may be something you uh, are a little reticent to share in, but that's the word he used. He also uses it for communication in Hebrews uh, 13, 16, or whoever the author is, sharing what you have, whether it be uh, support financially or whether it be love uh, or, or actually knowledge. In fact, uh, that's one of the reasons that I think one of the translations uses communication, because in the context, it was talking about sharing wisdom with one another. And then the last one is communion. It's actually translated communion in a number of places. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, sharing in the body and the blood of the Lord, of Christ. Or in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, we have the communion, he says, of the Holy Spirit. In 1 John 3, he talks about fellowship with the Father, with Jesus. We walk in the light. We have this communion, this intimacy with him. Uh, and he uses it as we are going to uh, later in the service when we share communion together. We're going to read that passage and see how that word fellowship means communion with the body and blood of Christ. So fellowship, what are some practical examples? Well, as one of the old preachers said, and I think Tisha mentioned this week in one of her texts, uh, it's fellowship means fellows in the same ship. You know, you, you got the same boat. We're in the same boat together. We're sharing a cruise together. And it also means family. Uh, what do you share as a family? You share bloodline, lineage perhaps. You share the last name. You share a home. You share goods. There's a lot of, sometimes you share goals. Uh, sports, you have the same team. And that team, each one has members doing a different role, but they typically gather in the same place. Hopefully they're in the same place when they're playing so that they can be a unit together with a common goal of winning games. Our workplaces, a workplace, it can be, that's where you have the a same company producing a product or service. I really enjoyed uh, my years at Mustang Engineering where I was responsible for building a team to do proposals for the company. And uh, we, I, I, for several years I was hiring, actually I was hiring nearly the, nearly the whole time because as the company grew, we had to have more proposal administrators and, and, uh, and proposal secretaries. And one of the things that doing proposals does for you, the job typically is what I understand, at least at that time in the industry when we went to the conferences, they said that people working in proposals in a high pressured uh, company like an engineering firm where there's millions of dollars on the line for the job you're proposing for and you, you can win or lose it. They said that the average length of time for a proposal person is 18 months. So we had a challenge in front of us. I was there 20 years, basically, at least 17 of which, 17 or 18 doing proposals. And I had most of my team with me that whole time, the people that I hired. So we were very unusual. One of the reasons is we laughed together, we played together, we worked hard and played hard and we formed a family. We had, I call it the proposal family. And we were able to endure the ups and downs, the long stresses, long hours because of that. What did we have? We had fellowship together. You also share fellowship maybe in a crisis. Harvey fellowship. That kind of rings a bell, doesn't it? We were all in a crisis, so we shared something together, a trial, a tribulation together. And we had some fellowship in that sharing of that. In fact, if you are on a ship like the Titanic, you've got double fellowship. You're on the same ship and you're in a crisis. So there's that idea of fellowship, meaning we share something that we're having to depend on one another very intimately uh, and consistently together to endure. But it's a whole nother level to talk about the church. The body of Christ is a, not just a community, not just an organization, not just a circumstance or a crisis, and not just a team. We're bought with blood. It's more like a family because there's a blood tie that brings us together. We're redeemed by that blood. We've been made into brothers and sisters in Christ. We have the same father and mother, as it were, with the Holy Spirit who broods over us, as Jesus says in John 3, and gives us birth. That new birth comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. So we have that family fellowship, and the goal that we have is an eternal fellowship where God fellowships with us in his tabernacle that he brings down from heaven. 
Heaven is God with us, fellowshipping with us, and us with Him. So some characteristics, you can see this in each one of these applications. I, I, I made five R's. There's a residence, you share the same place. Uh, you know, it can be a stadium or a ship or a home or the body of Christ. It can be a relationship. That's one of the characteristics. There's family members, teammates, coworkers. There's responsibilities, maintaining the ship, navigating the ship, or household chores, or maybe your particular position on the sports team or your work assignment, or for the Jesus body, the, the different body parts. Paul talks about the foot, uh, the head, the eye, the ear. And then there's restrictions. You're limited by certain things. That's part of what makes that fellowship work. On a ship, you're limited by the rails on the ship. Nobody's going to be getting past uh, the railing on the ship. In the home, there's parental rules or rules of the game if you're in sports or a company policy if your fellowship is there. But in the New Testament exhortation, it's the Spirit's guidance. And then there are rewards. There's the ultimate objective. There's the cruise destination. There's a healthy marriage. There's responsible godly offspring. Or there's winning the Super Bowl if you're in sports. There's a good product or a good service and a successful business. But for the body of Christ, the goal is edification, the building up of the body of Christ. And that edification, that building up has a goal till we come into the fullness of Christ, bringing this ragtag group of different peoples from different levels with different gifts and skills and problems, bringing them all together and building them up until that body of Christ in the church looks like the body of Christ in reality. Flourishing. We want a flourishing fellowship, one that thrives and therefore builds us up. And so let's look real quickly at those five things and a couple of scriptures with each one. The church, the true location of the church is in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, baptized by his spirit into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you are members individually. That's the residence. That's where we abide. Abide in me, he said, and I in you. So you abide there. It's not the building. We gather here for convenience. It's not one church. It's the church universal with all of the parts of the body, all the believers that he's redeemed by his blood, who, have, he, who he has now made brothers and sisters coming together in a body. Then our relationship. Our fellowship is created by relationships. First with Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He uses the word fellowship to mean relationship with Jesus and the Father, and then we have relationship with one another because of that common, bond, common tie, that common bond. Many members, but one body. The relationship with one another is as members of one another. 1 Corinthians 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are still one body, so also is Christ. Or how about Romans 12, 5? So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. There's an eternal tie here. Now notice, when the body is amalgamated, when it is assembled, when it is put together by the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't lose your individuality. Paul says over and over again, we are individuals and members of the body of Christ. We don't get lost. Your identity is not lost. This is a community, it's not communism, where you just are a cog in the machine and the individual is lost in the system. This is a community that binds us together in relationships. Then there's responsibilities. We all have different gifts and callings, different responsibilities, and the same spirit is working to tie all of those gifts together to make them function. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. There are differences of ministries. I'm summarizing some of this. And, and ministries is translated administrations in some translations. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. 
There are diversities of activities or operations, but it's the same God who works all in all. For the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of us for the profit of all of us. The manifestation of the Spirit, He gifts you, He blends you together, and He tasks you with things that He's going to draw together to make the body full and functioning. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, All of these gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions or distributes to each one individually as He wills. Notice that phrase. It's His will, it's His doing, and He apportions it not as a group, but as individuals. He equips each member. You have a unique relationship with Jesus. As illustrated in the end, when Jesus is giving letters to the churches, to one of the churches, He said, to the one who overcomes, to the one who gains that reward in the end, I will give him a white stone with a name on it that only you and I know. You never lose your individual relationship with him even though you're amalgamated into a body. In 1 Corinthians 12, 18, God has set the members himself, each one of them, notice that emphasis again on individuality, in the body just as he pleased. So you might wish that you had gifts that you didn't have, but you got the ones that God pleased for you to have. One of the problems, as I said last week, that I think we often have is we don't know what our gifts are. One of the things I did at Mustang a number of times is we went through the Myers-Briggs things and and several other gifting type of surveys and tests to try to find out where everybody was. And when you map it out, say on the Myers-Briggs, you map it out, there are 16 different personality types. Well, I needed all of them. So when we were hiring people, we looked at that to see where this person would plug in. And that was very, very helpful. So it's very, very important for us to find out individually how God gifted us so that we know where to plug in to the body of Christ. And it's important for the elders and the leaders of the body to make sure everybody has a place to plug in, that they've opened up the door to that particular gift. Then there's the purpose of the gifts. What's the purpose of all these gifts? It's Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, I'm going to sum it up in two phrases, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ until it becomes mature. Equipping and edifying. He equips you and he builds you up. He edifies you. He prepares you. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul, through verse 15 through 26, Paul, that's where he makes that analogy of the foot, the hand, the ear, and the eye. You know, the foot can't say to the hand, well, because I'm not the hand, I ha- I'm not of the body. No, it's still of the body. The ear can't say to the eye, well, because I'm not the eye, that was what I had wanted to be. I wanted to be the eye. Instead, I hear everything, but I can't see anything. But because of that reason, whether or not he likes it or not, for that reason, it says he's not part of the body. He is a part of the body. He doesn't eject himself just because he doesn't like his gift. This requires mutual cooperation. And by, boy, I tell you, it is, it is difficult to cooperate, isn't it? Especially going back to that Myers-Briggs things, I would have people in my group with very different personalities doing things very differently. But they had to work together. They saw things differently. I had someone in my group at one point. Everybody wanted this lady. All the other departments wanted her. She had, she had quit for a little while to have a baby, and when she came back, she was going to come back part-time. Well, she was uh, one of the key people in, in one of my Bible studies, so she was a, a, a believer, but she was also very gifted in just about every area. So all the department managers wondered, well, I got her. Well, she's very organized, spreadsheet organization, meticulous. You know, everything had its place, and that's what I needed. I had to surround myself with people like that because my gift is not that. As Iva will let you know, when Bob prepares a sermon, it's very organized all the way through, and Iva knows what to expect. But when David prepares a sermon, she has no idea what to expect or when she's going to get anything. And uh, I'm trying to be better about it, Iva, if you can hear me over there. At any rate, um, it's, it's all, uh, those gifts have to work together. And so she, uh, we brought her in, and she's very organized, and I am a vision person. I'm the visionary. That was my gift. So I had to surround myself with organized people. And so we had to communicate. Well, one day she would be ready to go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and I wouldn't be ready to go there yet. So one day I said, uh, I guess I'm driving you crazy. And she goes, no, not really. She said, my mom is like you. So I learned how to do this. 
from my mom. And she said, I realize that your gift is you live in the moment. And she says, I'm so busy trying to get to the next thing that I miss all sorts of connections with people. And she, and she described some very painful examples. So she said, I learned from the person who is living in the moment, who has a vision for where we're going. Anyway, there's the purpose of the gifts is edification, but it requires cooperation. So what are our responsibilities for one another? Well, I thought that the best way to do that is to make a list of the one another's of Scripture. What is our role? How do we cooperate? How do we participate in the body of Christ? Through the one another's. So I made you a list of the top five. Love one another in various ways, strongly urge, sometimes with lots of adjectives, like with fervent hearts and a fervent spirit, is mentioned 16 times in the New Testament, according to this list that I researched. I didn't count them myself. Encourage one another is five times. Greet one another with a holy kiss is four times. I notice we don't do that very well. <laughs> Emphasis on holy. Bear and be patient with one another is three times. Forgive, honor, serve, and live in harmony is all tied with two times each. This is a great list to go over when you say, how am I doing in the body? What do I need to be doing in the body? What are my responsibilities in the body? I would, I'm thinking about at least for me, maybe for you, printing this list out because I don't do a lot of these very well at all. It's very convicting to read through it and, uh, and, and posting it somewhere so I can remind myself of what my responsibilities are in this fellowship. Others are accept one another, admonish one another, be at peace with one another, be devoted to one another, be kind to one another, build up one another. And in fact, in one place, Paul says, let all your speech be that that builds somebody up, not tears them down. Have concern for one another, instruct one another. There's the teaching, pray for one another, prefer one another, show hospitality to one another, sing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, submit to one another, teach one another, and wait for one another. In fact, that wait for one another is in the passage on communion that we'll get to later when we have communion. So what do we not do? These are the things we do for one another. What do we not do to one another? Judge, bite, devour, provoke, and envy, lie, and slander. Those are all mentioned in Scripture. Don't judge, don't bite, don't devour one another, don't provoke one another, don't lie to one another. But the most important responsibility as illustrated by how often it is mentioned in Scripture, is love. Love one another. In fact, the description of the body of Christ, so eloquently put in 1 Corinthians 12, and then followed up in 1 Corinthians 14, has right in the middle 1 Corinthians 13. At the end of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking about all the gifts. All are not apostles, all are not prophets. And he says, desire the gifts, but I show you a more excellent way. And then he has the chapter on love. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries without love, I am nothing. If I have the gift of tongues and have not love, it profits me nothing. If I give my body as a sacrifice to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Notice love is the central theme of that passage from 12 to 14 when it talks about how the body fits together with all of its giftings. Colossians 3.14 says this, after it gives a whole string of admonishments about how we should walk, it says, above everything else, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. It's the perfect bond of unity. In a fellowship, you need something to glue all the members together as they cooperate. Love binds the members together in perfect harmony. Ephesians 4 says, speaking the truth, as part of the gift, because it just got through listing the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Lots of speaking gifts there. But with one another, he says, speaking the truth, the truth is what we mentioned last week, in love. Speaking the truth in love, this is how you grow up in all things into him, into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by, listen to this, what every joint is supplying according to the effective working in the measure of every part that's doing its share. Let me repeat that. Every joint is supplying something, his gifts, and it's effectively working. He's not just supplying it grudgingly, partially, anemically. He's supplying it effectively. Every part is doing its share. And that will cause Ephesians 4, 
16 says, the body to grow into and edify itself in love. It is built up in love. Love means time. Loving someone always involves a commitment of time. Loving God involves a commitment of time. Much of what has been shared from this pulpit is about prayer and time alone with God daily. You need time alone with God just like you need time alone with your spouse. That dynamic is the same in Scripture. We are the bride of Christ. We need time with Him. And fellowship or expressing love to one another involves, I think, four C's. Communication, sharing life together and catching up on what's happening with each other's life. Compassion, in the text we will read later, I think in the communion text, he says, weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. Celebration is the rejoice with those who rejoice. And communion is the intimacy at a heart level, the face-to-face. So there's communication, compassion, celebration, and communion. That's part of how you love one another. That's part of how you keep the fellowship knit together. But there are some restrictions in the body, in the fellowship. For one thing, you're restricted with your ability and your calling. The gift that you have naturally restricts you. If you're not the eye, you're not the eye. If you're not the hand, you're not the hand. There's only a few things the feet can do, and the feet can't do what the eye does. The ear can't do what the hand does. So there's some natural restrictions based on how you're gifted. But he distributed it, that, those giftings, as he wants to by the same Spirit. In Romans 12, 4 and 6, it says, All the members do not have the same function. In one translation, it says office. We don't have the same function. So we're limited in, 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 in uh, many aspects to our function. Having them gifts differing according to the grace that is given us. So let us use them. I hardly know what that means. But God has given us a certain amount of grace, a certain kind of grace that relates to our gifting. And we have to operate in that grace through that gifting. Sometimes we try to operate with somebody else's gift and the grace isn't there and things fall apart. Ephesians 4 talks about the diversities of administrations and operations. He gave some to be apostles. Notice he said some. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, all are not apostles, are they? Some prophets, all are not prophets, are they? Some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Again, recognizing what the administrative manifestation gift you have. We're also restricted in our relationships. As I quoted briefly a moment ago, 2 Corinthians 6 says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There are certain restrictions you have when you become a part of the body of Christ. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Keep yourself pure. And at one point he says, be separate from the world. Watch out that you don't love the world so much and link up with them in a partnership and a fellowship that spoils your fellowship with Jesus and with the church. You're restricted in how you can use your gifts. In 1 Corinthians 14, from about verse 26 to the end of the chapter, he talks about these various controversial gifts like tongues and prophecies and other things that if you're in a Bible church or, or, a, or a Baptist church like I was raised in, you hardly know what to do with that sometimes. Uh, or, or the churches I grew up in didn't know what to do with all that. But one of the points that Paul makes is because of these different giftings that can get out of hand, there are some restrictions on how you use them. And here you listed some. Make room for each gift. Let all things be done for edification. If it's not edifying, you're not, you're not using your gift properly. Or do it two or three at a time, one by one, everyone in turn. Or your gift, your contribution is subject to interpretation, evaluation, and confirmation by elders and leaders. It says the, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. So the prophets have to be accountable to one another. All things should be done decently and in order because God is not the author of confusion. Those are some restrictions. There's also some restricted beliefs as a part of your fellowship in the body of Christ. Sound doctrine, which we talked about last week, is one of them. Listen to these two passages that talk about how important it is to have true, sound doctrine, to restrict ourselves to what is true. Paul says, if you instruct the brothers in these things, he instruct, he's instructing Timothy, then you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of sound doctrine, which you have carefully followed, but have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Be careful that you restrict yourself to the truth. 
He says later to Timothy, for the time's coming when people will not endure sound teaching, true teaching, the apostles' doctrine. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And if ever there's a day when that's happening in our culture, it's today. Finally, there's restricted behavior. 1 John 1 says, if we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Notice he starts out, if we say we have fellowship with him, but we're walking in darkness, we're really lying to ourselves. We're disconnected. But then when he says, but if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. When we connect to the head, we all have fellowship with one another. So your primary goal is fellowship with Jesus, and then the rest sorts itself out. Your fellowship with one another is a part of it. And what keeps us from fellowshipping with one another or from fellowshipping with Jesus, it's sin in our life. So he says... If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Finally, there's the maturity. What's our goal? Where are we going? How do we know when we're mature? Well, the, fight, the real maturity, the real goal is Jesus. When we look like him, then we're mature. When fellowship reaches its full fruition, we will be like him. We will see him as he is. And as Paul said, my goal, my final prize is to know him and to be like him. The reward of a flourishing fellowship is that we grow to maturity. Back to Ephesians 4. When the body speaks the truth in love and has every member effectively doing its part, then the body will grow to a perfect place of purity Unity and maturity. Purity, no longer children tricked by false teaching. Unity, no longer divided by the faith. And maturity, no longer falling short of Christ's fullness. So let's apply these lessons to us. I think Trinity has done this well in a number of ways. One of the things I think of when I think of certain aspects of fellowship is Todd. Todd has been tireless in his efforts to establish home groups and to keep us going to the home groups and committed to the home groups from the beginning. Guess what home groups are? As we'll look next week, they're going from house to house in that new church, connecting with one another. That's where fellowship can take place. It's a key element of fellowship. He's also been tireless about men's fellowships, weekly prayer meetings, monthly breakfasts, annual retreats. Now he's been working on youth ministry, getting youth together to get connected, to find, their, to find the Lord first and then to find their gifts and their place in the body in relationship to one another. We've had Bible studies throughout Trinity's history, lots of good Bible studies. The women especially had lots of wonderful Bible studies that I tried to keep up with sometimes through Susan. And we are pretty good about being there for one another during times of crisis. Harvey is a good example of that, but also celebration, weddings, births, graduations. I think we've been doing some of those things well, and I just encourage us, let's keep doing those things. So to close, what can we do to improve our fellowship? Well, keep up that good work, but consider a couple of things, as I've already mentioned. Number one, consider the one another's in Scripture and ask one by one, am I doing this? I think that will help us improve individually. Continue meeting each other's needs as they did in Acts. They had meals in times of of crisis, they had meals for widows, they were constantly meeting each other's needs. And on two or three occasions, it says no one in the church that claimed Christ, that was a part of the body, had any needs. They were very good at meeting each other's needs. So let's be sensitive to that in the future as we have in the past and figure out a way to make that grow. Please continue to pray for one another. Praying for one another is essential. Continue the daily communication and consider it how to be better at communication. Life updates, input. Don't let Sunday be the only time that you connect with the other members of the body. One of the things that I've treasured uh, in my home group, uh, which has the Wales and the Earlies and the Myers and the Zeeks. I didn't say McCree this time. <laughs> I've said that several times. I keep trying to, you know. After 30 years of having Kathy as my doctor, it's a little difficult to make that transition. 
But these are all a part of my home group. And one of the blessings that we've had that's fellowship for us is sharing the prayer needs over a text group. We have a text group, prayer and praise. So all this week, we've been praying for Oppie's eyes, for the, uh, her parents and Dan's in, in the past, and, and, for, and we've been praying for one another in various ways. Been praying for Martin through those texts and so forth. That's a great way to stay in touch. Communication. Continue to figure out. It says they were meeting daily in the temple and house to house. So figure out how to have some daily communication. And most importantly, love one another. I think the most important question to ask is, how can I love my fellow Trinity Fellowship member better? With this prayer of Paul's in mind, he talks to one of the churches and he says, I hear about how you're loving one another. And he says, I'm praying that, you, that your love may abound yet more and more. So one of the ways you can improve is always ask, how can I love my Trinity Fellowship members better? How can I show more compassion? How can I celebrate with them when something good happens? How can I better contact at a heart level? Is there somebody that I can uh, share my burden with? Is there somebody that I can mentor or that can mentor me? As John said in 2 John 12, I have many things I want to write to you, but I don't wish to do it with pen and ink. But I wish to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The fullness of joy comes when you're face to face. So figure out how to meet with people. And consider Jesus. He did this well. He related to the multitudes at one level and then to the 500 and then to the 120, which ended up in the upper room at another level. With the 70, he related to them at another level and sent them out representing him. And then there was the 12. And then there was the three, Peter, James, and John. And then there was the disciple whom Jesus loved, that one that John saw with different eyes and wrote a different gospel because of how he saw Jesus in that relationship. So is there someone who you can share mutual encouragement at that level? Above all things, Peter says, fervently love one another for love will cover a multitude of sins. Above all things, Paul says in Colossians, put on love. That's what binds and knits everything together in a perfect harmony. And that is what fellowship is.